Hello, people. Welcome back to the podcast. My name is Katie Cleaver, and I'm your host. Today, we've got an interview with Dr. Kate King. You guys are going to love this. You're really going to love it. I'm, uh, I love her burnout perspective. It's very refreshing. It's very empowering. Um, love the interview. I'll give you a little bit of background on her. She's an associate professor in the clinical psychology doctoral program at William James College. She has worked and trained in a variety of medical and mental health care settings. Along the way, she has collaborated with all kinds of helping professionals, doctors, nurses, social workers, just to name a few. Dr. King has trained countless helpers to better care for their own well-being over the years as a speaker, educator, and workshop leader. So we're going to talk about her book in this episode. I read it to prepare for it, and it's all highlighted. Y'all highly recommend it. You can check that out um, to learn more about her specifically, learn more about her book. You can go to thewellhelper.com. That's thewellhelper.com. So without any further ado, let's get into the interview. Well, thank you, Dr. King, for joining us. I am so excited to share um, your book with everybody. I loved it. Uh, I'm so uh, grateful to have a uh, resource for nurses because this topic of burnout is really big and scary, kind of, and you just don't even like know where to start. So, um, so very taboo. Yeah. Yeah. There's a lot of buzzwords, um, mm-hmm. and as and my primary audience is new nurses or graduating students, so it's like it's it's very difficult to navigate on top of just learning how to survive every day. Mm-hmm. So your your book started off with like this painfully accurate <laughs> description of like actual burnout feelings because you get these like vague like oh you're tired and yes we're all tired but I just mm-hmm. want to you wrote you resign yourself to enduring a life of suffering thinking there's no way out and you just sort of wilt. Yeah. I, man, I've worked on various units and floated to n- units. And it was like, we're a bunch of wilty nurses. You can see and, the wiltedness in the department. And yeah, mm-hmm. it's palpable. And, and you, the term learned helplessness yes. and the resulting in this like jaded, snarky, cynical mm-hmm. perspective, which is really hard for those students who are just there and bright eyed and so excited to learn. Right. right yeah. Or the new grads. Um, and then you, you know, or people complain and then they go, or could go silent and quiet when suggest taking action like that paralysis. So yeah, that really hit home because we're oh, all very- <laughs> yes. well, I'm, I'm both happy and not happy that that's hit home for you. <laughs> yes. And I, and unfortunately not- it describes, I think what a lot of, a lot of people either experience themselves or see in their departments with people they work with, which is that burnout it, and variations on burnout, things like compassion fatigue and, you know, other buzzwords that are out there to describe the experience of just not really fully showing up at work anymore, you know, mm-hmm. and not getting to live that mission and the dream that you had had really hoped for when you were a student and when you first launched out into the field. And, and yeah, it's very, very hard to see that. Yeah. I, and there's so much hope and excitement for students. And then they either see those nurses on the unit who are, or who are, who are in the, that like phase of burnout. Um, and they get really like down because is this, am I destined to do this? Am I, so that's one of my first questions is, Do students, do new nurses who are not burned out yet need to be proactive about this? Is this destined to happen to everyone? Um, How how can someone who's like looking at it, like I'm about to walk into this, I don't want this to happen, but is it, am I special? You know what I mean? Or maybe I won't, maybe it won't. Maybe I just need to wait and see if it happens. Like how do you uh, advise those people getting ready to enter the helping profession? Yeah, thanks. Yeah. And and there's a reason for the book that I chose a subtitle, which is to get, it's called Get Ahead of Burnout, Thrive at Work and Unlock the Personal Growth Potential of the Helping Profession. So I really want people to be thinking about burnout as something you can get ahead of, you know, that it's not just 
the clock is ticking until it's your turn and then you're going to be miserable perhaps indefinitely, <laughs> you know, but the thing to do is to be paying attention to it now. So when you see those, you know, maybe other nurses who you are training with, like you're describing, you show up and you're like, oh, like, I think this person is kind of burned out. Like, let's use that as an opportunity to say, like, I don't want that to happen to me, you know, but there's nothing like there's it's not it's not like there's one thing that predicts burnout, um, but not paying attention to what your risk factors are <laughs> and managing those, I would say, would be one of the better predictors. If you're not paying attention, if you're just, oh, I'll just get by, I just do what I have to do, I'll deal with it later, I don't have time to feel, I don't have time to think about that, I'm too busy to pay attention to what's going on. Like all those things just create a backlog and a pile up, you know, which then <laughs> will catch up with you eventually. Um, so I would say like, if you, you know, are tend to be somebody who's proactive, if you tend to be somebody who is self-reflective, if you're doing your self-care, you're doing your therapy, you're doing your journaling, like the, it's, it's going to serve you in the long run. It's going to be less likely for you. Um, but, but helping other people is hard, you know, people are hard, <laughs> you yeah. know? Yeah. So if you're not paying attention or you're putting it off and again, like you're not noticing, you know, where your potential vulnerabilities are going in, then I'm afraid that's going to be, that's going to catch up to people eventually, which is why I wrote the book, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I know you talked about self-criticism and stuff and I feel, and perfectionism, and I feel like that's something that's common. Um, in nurses, because I think that what, what was it? Uh, I can't remember the exact quote you had been there, but it was like, if I'm not, if I don't, if I make mistakes, people die. Right. And then, yeah. or maybe we have this your unrealistic expectation that only bad nurses make mistakes or bad nurses um, struggle with this. Right. right. You know what I mean? Like the, mm -hmm. I think that can be the pervasive, like, oh, if I need need to do this, then there's something wrong with me. Uh, do you run into that? Uh, obviously, it's in the book, so but <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right. So the the good bad nurse archetype, right, mm -hmm. that you just described, like, I don't want to be one of those bad nurses. So mm -hmm. I better be good and perfect in every way. <laughs> you know, so and that's that, that internal self criticism. So yeah, I mean, if I were in a healthcare setting and I needed help and care from someone, I would sure hope my nurse aspired to extraordinarily high standards. <laughs> you know, like mm -hmm. like as you're as you're as you're sort of quoting me. So <laughs> like people often think, well, yeah, I need to be perfect in my work because if I'm not, people die, you know, or or you know, I make grave errors and I can get sued or something. Mm -hmm. Of course, I'm not saying show up to your work and have no standards and shrug off whether you do good or bad, you know, in a, in a given thing. But if there's a pattern of perfectionism that you carry with you throughout your life, if you have, which perfectionism is connected to self-criticism, right? Mm -hmm. And that's where it becomes problematic. We can easily imagine forward the ways in which perfectionism actually gets in the way. If you're someone who's perfectionistic, again, and like rigidly and harshly self-critical and you make a mistake, are you going to be defensive when someone points that out? Or are you going to be humble and gracious? You'll probably be defensive. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you mm -hmm. know, are you going to learn from that mistake or you're going to try to shove it out of your mind as quickly as possible because you can't bear to think about it? You know, so actually like that self-critical perfectionistic impulse often doesn't serve us, you know, it, even though we think it does, it can actually undermine us. Whereas if we could, and I offer, I offer different frames in the book besides perfectionism, because perfect is an impossible standard across a whole career, right? You might do a procedure and have it go very well and be like, it couldn't have been better, right? Perfect, <laughs> you know? like the blood draw or something like, yes, I nailed that, right? That felt good. Like no one got hurt. Like I did what I needed to do. Like, especially when you're in training and you do it for the first time, you must feel like, yes, I did that. Yes. Or you get a perfect score on a test. It's not that you can't enjoy that or aspire to those things going well. But if you think about your whole career, are you expecting you'll never make a mistake? 
you know, that you'll never just not be at your best one day because maybe you worked a double the day before at the end of an overnight shift or something like that's going to happen. So how can we create a place inside of ourselves, you know, with some self-compassion and kindness, which I discuss at length in the book as well, so that when you do make a mistake, you can have a soft landing inside yourself. You know, you can be like, oof, I got to learn from that. Ouch. You know, that's that's painful. I'm so sorry I did that. Maybe there's something you can do after the fact to address it. Um, but that you can do that from a self-compassionate place, you know, not from that, like, crack the whip, I'm a terrible person, mm -hmm. blah, 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 kind of thing that ends up getting in the way. Yeah, it's almost like we deny our own humanity. Like, we're not, like, allowed to make any mistakes. And if we do, it's this terrible thing. And it's sometimes I wonder if we cultivate that in nursing school with our grading and our, mm -hmm. you, like, our, the verbiage of, like, how important this profession is, and you can't yes. make mistakes, and we get built up like the good nurse doesn't make mistakes, and only bad nurses do these things, and you're not going to do that because you're going to be amazing, mm -hmm. and then reality shock. Right. How could you just ever sustain that for a whole career, like at that at that level? Yeah. And, and then you start off, too, as like a, when you are a new nurse, you're constantly corrected because, mm -hmm. you know, you're doing things wrong. It's normal. Mm -hmm. Like, you're clunky and right. awkward, and but you're corrected, and it just feels... Like, it's very difficult because you mm -hmm. thought when you got RN behind your name, mm -hmm. you we're just going to slide right in here and be completely mm -hmm. prepared. So there's this uh, big adjustment, I think, that doesn't real that makes it like the perfect breeding ground, I think, for like burnout, essentially. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> right. If you can't handle feedback and or you think like, oh, now that I've got the RN after my name, I'm good, mm -hmm. <laughs> you mm -hmm. know, then yeah, that's not going to, and that's not going to serve you well, not just at work, but in life. Like we need to take feedback from people who love us and in our yeah. friendship and family. And, you know, it's a skill set that, you know, shows up at work, but also in other areas of our life as well. So maybe as a student, you learn to take feedback, you know, that would be the ideal outcome is like, you don't get like, ouch, ooh, ooh, ow, it's like a zing every time, you know, somebody who's, who's training you gives you that input, you start to be like, oh, oh, okay, like, I can roll with all this. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? um, and that will serve you well going into your career. Yeah, yeah, um, I think it's defensive and, and harsh and self critical. And, you know, every time someone gives you that input, then it's just going to get worse, <laughs> you know, over time. You know? Yeah, yeah, it's a lot to like, try to navigate um, your expectations versus reality. And um, as you grow as a nurse, and with all, kind of all the like, pre the normal pressure that, sh you know, should be there when you're caring for people and lives are a thing like that just it's like I'm not getting somebody's money messed up or like Excel spreadsheets or whatever it might be or it's like oh if I do this wrong I could uh, hurt someone which I think is it can be a little bit suffocating yes. you know to navigate yeah yeah um one of the things that I do really appreciate in your book that you really flesh out in detail and we won't, I don't want you, you know, want people to check out the book, but mm -hmm. is, you know, the practice of self-care, which tends to kind of get oversimplified into like, okay, now you need to go do these things, these kind of external things like pampering yourself or doing things you enjoy, which I think I have a role. Absolutely. But I notice your focus on, um, the myth of like the work-life balance that you talk about, which I really liked how you framed that. Um, and looking for like these activities of self-care as if going to do X will, if I just get enough of whatever it is I enjoy, mm -hmm. then I won't be burnt out. Like, why is that not the right way to look at this? Right. Thank you. Yeah, that's great. I've got there's so much said about self care. And it's it's sort of turned into this thing where there's kind of two camps, it seems in the in the public conversation, there's either like, self care is the answer, go to another yoga class, mm -hmm. take a bubble bath and this sort of thing. Or like, self care is unnecessary, or like self care is problematic, we've got structural problems, we can't take care of ourselves, but you know, that kind of stuff. And, and I think we've got to go like both and we have to synthesize like there's, there's good and bad and useful perspectives and all of that. 
Um, the reality is we do need to care for ourselves along with also trying to improve the systems in the world that we work and function in. Um, and also when we care for ourselves, there's a lot of ways to do that. And one of the biggest myths I think is that self-care has to be a thing you do. So one of the things I'm, I think is really important. And if I had to pick like, this is one of the big messages of the book is like self-care doesn't have to be a thing you do. Self-care is a way of being right. So that includes like, again, are you self-critical? You can change your self-care by how you talk to yourself in your head all day. Are you just berating yourself all day long and comparing yourself negatively against other people all day long? That's not very self-caring. Yeah. And so if you're looking for a way to improve your self-care that doesn't take more time necessarily, you don't have time for a you know massage or something, well, just start to notice, like, how harsh is it up there? <laughs> you know, between those ears. And can we just offer a little kindness and generosity to ourselves? And I say, I say just, I mean, that's a lifelong journey for a lot of folks to, <laughs> to start to find a little bit of that self-kindness, but that counts. And in fact, you know, as I said, as I say somewhere in the book, like you could go to a, get a massage, but you could spend the whole hour of that mas massage feeling guilty about taking the hour off from work or away from your family. You could spend that hour feeling self-critical about your body, or you could spend that hour just not even in your body, but thinking about work and all the things you have to do tomorrow. Yeah. So it's not just showing up somewhere that you think is self-caring or some activity that has been deemed to be, a, you know, it's on the little you know, Instagram spreadsheet of self-care behaviors or something, you know, <laughs> like there's how, how you do it matters, you know, and also just, again, it doesn't have to be another thing. You don't, it's not about finding time. If you have time, if you find time and you can do things, that's great. Um, but there's a lot that we can do in just how we manage our day-to-day -day experience which also maybe ties into some of the stuff I talk about in terms of managing our stress response, right? And being able to notice when we're getting cranked up, you know, like with the cortisol running through our body and fired up, or we're just like getting really edgy or irritable or checking out or numbed out, you know, just starting to notice that on a day-to-day -day basis and taking tiny little mini slivers of time to just give ourselves a moment to like soften a muscle, <laughs> take a breath, you know, um, again, you're breathing anyway, <laughs> you know? <laughs> yes. I, you know, one of the things that I appreciated about the book was your discussion just of physiological response to stress, because we're like in stress, not just like nervousness, but like, oh, I'm seeing somebody die in front of me that are starting to die. And it's my responsibility to do something about it. That should trigger your fight or flight response. Exactly. It's there for a reason. We need you to be in that stress response in a crisis. <laughs> right. And it's like how it is difficult when you work in a job that requires your stress response to perform and you have to figure out how to perform well, and then also be able to like, transition home yes. and be able to do all those things. And it just, I feel like that is, if that's not the highest level of executive function, totally. <laughs> yeah. What, how much more like, <laughs> like I'm aware that I'm not being eaten by a lion or one's not chasing me. I'm mm -hmm. saving, trying to save someone's life and I need to access that <laughs> high level thinking that's up here, mm -hmm. but it's so hard to get up there. Um, I, I just so appreciate that because I feel like that, again, humanizes us. You know, mm -hmm. this whole nurses are superhuman. I really don't love that because it makes it feel like you should just be able to perform. But your brain works like everybody's brain does. And it gets to like a place where it's difficult to perform when you're terrified. Yeah, then, exactly. Yeah. And we're wired to have the stress response kick on quickly and to go off like slowly you know, mm -hmm. so like it goes on at an instant and then it's really hard to turn it off because again, if we think about survival and, you know, all that stuff, like it serves us to be in a stress response, just our basic survival, like at an animal level. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> you know? So it goes on easy and turns off. It's hard to turn it off. 
And yeah. with the relaxation response, it's hard to turn it on and easy to lose it. <laughs> we're How wired. rude. <laughs> <laughs> Not cool. <laughs> with your brain. <laughs> yeah. And, and then you think like, let's practical set, like you're a med surge nurse, your patient has a rapid response and has a code. And then let's say it gets situated. Maybe the patient goes to the ICU or whatever, and everything's fine. And you got all revved up. Well, you can't just go to a room and try to turn on your rest and digest and like transition. You have to go into busyness for your five other patients. And then how, like that must over a long period of time, unless you're extremely intentional about it, really wreak havoc on your body. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. That's why we see so many folks in healthcare professions with stress-related disorders and chronic health problems over the time, over time. Um, after being in a stress response at work for 20 years, you know? Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah. yeah. So I mean, one thing that, I, that I'll offer is uh, an analogy and a perspective from performance psychology and sports psychology, right? So when you think about athletes, endurance athletes, Olympic athletes, or even music and like people who do performances, mm-hmm. that, that it is possible, and those people are good examples of developing the skill of learning to have your, I'm like doing like a gear shift, you know, image in my hand here, like being able to gear up as much as you need, but not too much. Mm -hmm. And then being opportunistic when you have a moment to gear down, you know, Ah. like, oh, crisis, bam. And we don't even have to think about it. We're just fired up, you know? (laughs) Mm -hmm. Yeah. When we're on the diving board, you know, at the Olympics, like it's on. (laughs) Now's my chance. Mm -hmm. If you rev up too much, you're going to overshoot. You're going to make a mistake, right? You're going to be like, I give the example in the book of like a guitarist at a big performance. If you're too cranked up on adrenaline, your fingers are going to be shaking. You know, same thing with like surgeons or healthcare workers who have to do like really intricate procedures. Like if your hands are shaking because you got so much adrenaline cranking that you're not going to be able to perform well, but you do need enough adrenaline or enough cortisol to keep you focused and on task. So it's not just like, oh, just be relaxed while you're doing the procedure. Like, no, <laughs> be on just as enough as you need to be. And, and it's so easy to say that it takes a long time to kind of learn to even work with your body and be attuned to your body enough to notice, okay, I need to gear up, you know, but I can't, like, I need to stop that before it gets to the point of actually impairing me, mm-hmm. you know. Uh, and similarly, where are those opportunities in my work life? where I can gear down even just one unit, you know, (laughs) like if it was like, you know, crisis, you're on, you know, you don't even have to think about it. You're just geared up. You handle that crisis. And then as you're saying, maybe that person, you know, is sent to the ICU or something, but like now you've got 10 other patients, but okay. You were at a 10, Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know, can we we gear down to an eight, you know, or like, do you have to go to the bathroom? Like you probably have to go to the bathroom or something. Can you like, Try to gear shift down to a five or even a three when you're like doing your trip to the bathroom (laughs) or you're walking to and from the patient's room or like, where are those little moments during your day that you can gear down a little bit, you know, nice long exhale, shake the muscles, just you're not going to get rid of all that adrenaline momentarily, you can't, your body has to metabolize it, you know, but you can take those moments to be like consciously, okay, this is a little down moment, you know? (laughs) Yeah. Yeah breath soften okay and then we move to the next thing and it's just again it's like the little micro shifts of regulating our stress response so we can be on and we can perform as needed but also not overdoing it and then also knowing when we can shift down and and just settle a little bit i love that analogy i think that's so helpful for nurses to be like okay i'm shifting up mm-hmm. and i'm aware like I, i'm noticing a theme of awareness yeah of like the situations I'm in, how I'm feeling physiologically, mm-hmm. emotionally, and being a little bit more like objective about it instead of like lost in it, which can make it really hard to have meaningfully move forward. And then, you know, next thing you know, you're at home, but you're still at a 10. Right, right, right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and like, you know, if you were, if you're a student, everything's new. So you don't know yet. Yes. <laughs> you know? So it is especially stressful to be a student. But when you land in a job that you stay at for a little while, you start to get to know the rhythm, you know, of that unit of that department. And you start to get a sense of, okay, we have this or that meeting every week, 
it's not very important. <laughs> I can show up, but I don't have to be at a 10 in the meeting for the hour or whatever. You know? Yeah, that'd be weird. <laughs> yeah, right, yeah. Um, but also like, here's yeah. the kinds of crises that tend to arise. And like, here are those moments where I can find for myself to downshift even a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. And sense of agency, like you're not helpless, you know, it's just, it's mm-hmm. learning. Yeah. I love that reminder that you are not <laughs> helpless. It's like, you're learning your body and your brain Yep. And your profession. Yep. And there's a learning, you like permission to be a beginner kind of thing. Yeah, totally, totally. Yeah. That's that's so helpful. And yeah, like I, I think I've had nurses who've messaged me or they went through all the work of school and then they got on their, you know, unit, then they saw a patient code or their patient didn't do well and they just froze. And yeah. they feel so much shame that, hey, I've done all this work. Like I'm supposed to, this is my the way I'm supposed to respond is supposed to be know what to do. And I am paralyzed. Mm -hmm. And I think that this is really reassuring to know that that's not something to be ashamed of. Exactly. It's your body, right? There's a crisis. And one of the ways our bodies handle crisis is to freeze, right? Mm -hmm. Oh, deer in headlights, that whole thing. Right. And that's bound to happen again. Think about like over the whole, you know, whether it's your whole training experience or even your whole career, what's the probability that anyone gets through a whole career dealing with crises every day and doesn't, Mm -hmm. you know, once, let alone many times, just have a brain freeze, you know, (laughs) in the moment. Again, we don't want that to happen, but we don't have to be ashamed when it does, because also that's not, it's not under your conscious control. Yeah. Like your lizard brain being like, I'm taking over, mm-hmm. you know, yeah. you say stop, you know, freeze, you know. Um, so, and I do like, you do also have a section on assertiveness, which is something that I like to talk about on my podcast and my blog and stuff that that is such a skill that we need to have as nurses. And I, and uh, talking about that in the context of the, the nervous system stuff, because it is very straightforward when your patient is crashing or whatever. Yes, stress response makes sense here. But when that really intimidating surgeon rounds mm-hmm. and talks to you, who's a 22-year-old fresh graduate who's not really sure how things are working and you ask the question and you get the condescending response or the – that sends you – like they ask you a question. You know you know the answer. You can't get to it in your brain. And – knowing how to uh, kind of stand up for yourself in a way that is professionally appropriate, um, you know, threading that needle is, I think that that like ha- just having a section on assertiveness in a burnout book, well, I was like, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because I mean, assertiveness is also part of how we create a work environment that's responsive to our needs, not just our own needs, but to, you know, everyone in our department potentially, or other people in our role or in our profession inside of our department. Um, so it's not, ju- it's not just asserting yourself. It's also a way of speaking up about, you know, what needs to change in the culture here. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And that may be certain people who get away with talking to nurses or students a certain way, <laughs> you know, I mean, it's, it's extra hard as a student to be assertive. So again, like extra grace to all students who are in that situation where you're in a one down position or a multiple positions down in a hierarchy, <laughs> you know, inside yes. of a setting. So it's it's always going to be harder to use your voice and be assertive when you're speaking up a power hierarchy to someone and also being needing to be a little extra cautious and thoughtful about when and how you do that when it is in that kind of a hierarchical system. Yeah, just like the permission that you know, you don't like, I, I think that can feed into the learned helplessness of like, if you don't have those assertiveness skills, mm-hmm. especially as you develop as a nurse in the profession, like, oh, people can just talk however they want to me. And it's like, no, actually, you can learn how to push back in a tactful way. And that's okay. Yeah. And also, I think one thing people often forget about assertiveness that might be worth saying, too, is that if you have a moment where something feels awful about how you were spoken to, let's say, um, and you feel like, oh, man, I just froze in the moment. I didn't say anything or like, Mm -hmm. uh like you can go back. Like you don't have to, like people are like, why didn't I think of that in the moment? (laughs) You know, now like I'm driving home and I have the perfect thing to say. (laughs) 
uh, which is t- such a common thing. But but if it matters enough, you can circle back, you know. And so it's okay in the moment if you just complied or you went along with it or you froze or you didn't know. But if it matters enough, you know, is it worth, you know, again, talking to a supervisor, going up the chain of command, whatever is the appropriate method in the setting that you're in, um, is it something that you do feel like you need to circle back to? Like, hey, you know, that thing that happened yesterday, I didn't feel good about that, or I was stressing about it all night, or, you know, maybe we could talk about, you know, what the culture is here around, you know, how people talk about whatever, you know, if you mm-hmm. feel like that's something that, and again, could you bring it to a trusted supervisor or a colleague? There's strength in numbers. I'm sure you're not the first or last person. This person's spoken to a certain way. And, Mm -hmm. you know, some Mm -hmm. things are intractable. I mean, I acknowledge that in the book. Like, there are just functional settings, (laughs) you know. And sometimes, you know, as hard as we try to influence it, we just can't. It's fraught. You know, there's just like a personality or a cultural problem in the department that just can't be addressed at least in the short term, as long as you're going to be there as a, as a student or, you know, maybe for an extended period of time. So it's not that, you know, everything hinges on your assertiveness and just because you're assertive, everything's going to get better. Mm-hmm. But the likelihood goes up often <laughs> when we have that skill set and we can be strategic and figure out who our allies are and what types of action might be effective. But sometimes in the moment is the worst time to do it, you know, because you're defensive, you're upset, you're not at your best. And neither are they, obviously, because they're already talking to you in a certain way. So clearly mm-hmm. they're in a moment that they're probably not super receptive. Mm-hmm. So often waiting. But so often people think if they miss the moment, they can't go back. And I'd love you to you know, have a takeaway around that too. It's just, you can go back and talk about stuff later. In fact, it's probably better when you're calmer to do so. Yeah, I actually, um, as you were talking, thinking of times where it was like later, hey, can we talk about that again? Um, I want to circle back on whatever Mm -hmm. it was because I I didn't like how that was left or I want to make sure I said X, Y, and Z so you understood X, Y, or whatever it might be. Yeah. Um, One of... One of the things I did, I was curious because I can just see the nurse brain mm-hmm. like responding to self-care and burnout and whatnot um, is I just need to use willpower. Like oh. if I just try hard enough, will it unfold the way it should? Like is willpower an effective burnout prevention plan? <laughs> Such a great question. Um I, I don't think so. <laughs> um, I'd have to see like when we're, who's this who's this person with the willpower and what exactly are they doing or what's going on between their ears. But if what we're talking about when you say willpower is like white knuckling, like just yeah. mm, like, just don't, I'm just going to survive this thing, <laughs> you know, that often that will undermine our well-being in the long term. Because again, that takes probably being in a heightened stress response for an extended period of time to push and persevere Mm -hmm. takes effort. And it can, it can also possibly feel sort of harsh. Again, if it's, if it's the kind of willpower, that's just like, I need to suck it up that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. (laughs) Yeah. That then that is likely, again, everyone's a little different. So I'm not going to say there's not somebody on the planet who managed to not burn out, you know? Yeah. Yeah. But also let's think about the higher bar of like thriving, you know, too. Uh, And like, is that sucking it up how you want to live your like one precious life, (laughs) you know, um, with the huge volume of hours we spend at work during our lifetime, you know, is that is that how you want to relate to your emotions, to your life, to your experience? Is that going to create like the most rich and rewarding life possible for you? Like, probably not. I don't know. Maybe you'll survive and you won't burn out, but I think we can do better. <laughs> yeah. Like Just raising playing and sucking it up. Yeah. You know? Like raising your, uh, uh, ra- raising your standard, I guess, of what like yeah. that. Yeah. Cause there is so much in a, like a helping profession, not just nursing that is really rewarding but I think to get to the like it's kind of interesting to have like that white knuckle willpower through you have to be like disconnected from yourself and in a sense but then if you're disconnected from yourself do you really experience the rewards that come from the helping profession Mm -hmm. where you're really in a moment with a patient and you've moved the needle for them Mm -hmm. it's like can you really enjoy that or to just to be able to get here you had to be jaded and like cold and calculated you know yeah yeah i'm here to say right no you can't 
you don't get to pick and choose the emotions that you have. And when you shut down one, you're going to shut down all of them, you know, or at least to some extent. So you're not going to get the full joy and delight and satisfaction either. Yeah. You know? and, and when we're talking new nurse, it's like, you, you just got done with a bunch of sprints. Like it feels like high school is a sprint to get to college. College is a sprint to get to your job. And then now it's a marathon, but you've had no marathon training. Right. And it's like, oh, we've got, uh, if I want to be able to enjoy this career that I've gone thousands of dollars into debt for and devoted years of my life, like uh, what, <laughs> like how can I actually optimize this rather than just merely get through it because yeah those are both options but which one is sustainable right, right. Um, yeah yeah and that you're going to look back on you know when you're looking at your retirement you're thinking i feel good about my career <laughs> you yeah. know like, yeah suck it up. life is probably when you're going to feel like hey, i missed out on something along the way here <laughs> yeah yeah and i also think that attitude of like sucking it up or dealing with it again if you're dealing with crisis after crisis like i hear this perspective a lot, which is just like, I don't have time to deal with it. Yeah. Right. Which I, on the one hand I get because you are bouncing between crises potentially, you know, so you're, you, you can't sit down and journal for an hour or like do a therapy appointment, you know, like after every single crisis. Right. But I think we overestimate what it takes to quote, deal with something. Sometimes just saying to yourself, whoa, that was hard. You know, like literally while you're walking to the next crisis. Yeah. <laughs> like, like, integrate the self-awareness of your emotional experience into your life. And there's going to be less of a pile up later, <laughs> you yes, know, like, whoa, yes. that was intense. Or like, whoo, like, you know, shake it off or, you know, just give yourself a moment. Don't, t instead of spending that moment saying, I need to suck it up. Like, what's the next thing? You could just spend that little moment being like, okay, I got this. And boy, that was intense, you know. And you that's know. free. You know? <laughs> right. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So finding little ways to, integrate awareness of your emotion or awareness of your stress or awareness of yourself into your day. Because if you don't do that again, what happens is you end up with a backlog. And then like after a decade, you finally, you know, you take medical leave or something and you finally yeah. go to a therapist or something. And you're like, I don't know where to start, you know, because there's yeah. like 20 traumas I haven't addressed, you know, and like a decade of ignored, you know, stress or struggle or whatever that like, bad habits that have been established to und undo and unwind and make sense of. So, yeah, we overestimate, I think, how much it takes to, mm -hmm. to process things and think we'll deal with it later. And that's not a good strategy. Well, I think that's encouraging because you do get to a point, even if you're earlier in your career and it just feels like too much to touch. Yeah. But just to know that you can take these little baby steps and it's not going to be this like, all right, this mm -hmm. antibiotic that's just going to fix everything and we're going to be fine. But it's like this, like, hey, you can practice these little things that can mm -hmm. really reduce the burden. And yeah, yeah we're overestimating how, how much you have to do to have a meaningful uh, uh, response or change in how you uh, react to things that can mm -hmm. really make it better for you because you deserve to like not suffer, right? Right. Right. Exactly. Right. And if something's hard, just saying to yourself, man, that was hard, you know, <laughs> like, yeah. or, or this feels like too much, you know, like just even mm -hmm. saying that, you know, or just like, I think I'm at my limit here. Or just acknowledging that can go a long way. Just like, again, think about how you talk to a friend, right? I was, mm -hmm. you know, when you're talking to yourself, I like to think about like, if you had a friend who was like, oh my God, I'm so overwhelmed. <laughs> You'd be yes. like, yeah, that sounds hard. <laughs> Boy, that feels good when they say that. Yeah, right? It's so much better than them trying to fix it and like do all that other stuff. Just, yeah. So just validating that experience. And then like often that's enough, right? You're just like, thank you. Yeah, okay. And then you can sort of, you've digested it. It's all, yes. you know, you can move on to the next thing. And also noticing your self-talk, which I, again, I've got a whole section of the book talking about. You might notice, are, are you frequently telling yourself, I can't handle this. It's too hard. It's mm -hmm. I'm, I'm overwhelmed. And, you know, is that, is that um, habit of interpreting or describing your experience helping you? You know, and are there other words and phrases you could at least sprinkle in there? You know, mm -hmm. like this feels like too much versus this is too much. Even that's kind of different, you know, or like, I don't know. I don't know how I'm going to get through this is very different than like, I can't handle this. <laughs> yes. Yes. Yeah. I'm hearing a lot of like self-awareness, self-kindness, mm -hmm. uh, self-compassion. 
Now I do want to, I feel like a lot of nurses experience burnout and there is a lot that like working through a book will really make huge changes in their lives over a long time, long term. But I just want, since I have you here with, yeah. what are the signs that someone really needs to see a professional pretty soon? And that maybe they're categorizing as burnout, but it's, mm -hmm. it, it's a much more serious thing that probably needs a professional support. Sure. sure. Yeah. Yeah. And um, the, the uh, ICD, the latest ICD has burnout listed as a, as a condition in need of service. <laughs> really? Yeah, I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah. So like burnout is a phenomena that requires clinical attention. <laughs> Yeah, in itself, right? It's validating. I, yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> Fatigue, concentration problems, impairment or redu reduced functioning at work, cynicism, you know, all that kind of stuff is, is very common in, in burnout. Um, but yeah, beyond that or outside of that, other, other things might be uh, things like post-traumatic stress that might be showing up in response to some experiences you've had at work. Um, now, after any kind of really intense uh, crisis experience that you might have had, um, it's normal to have a little bit of intrusion into your everyday life, you know, for a, a little short period of time afterwards, like after any, you know, anyone who's had like even a fender bender knows, like for a few days, you get behind the wheel and you're yeah. like, whoa, you yeah. know, so like this yes. feels you know, so if you're dealing with life or death stakes at work, it makes sense that you're going to have like periodic intrusions, you know, thinking or, you know, images or whatever that might show up occasionally for a little while outside of work. But if that persists, gets worse, if you're having nightmares, if you feel like you're, you know, working with one patient, but kind of re-experience something that happened with another mm -hmm. patient in the past. Um, if it's crowding out your ability to be in the present, because again, you're like still replaying past uh, crises in your mind. Um, yeah, it's getting in the way of your sleep, that kind of stuff. You feel like you're extra, like hypervigilant a lot, you know, those, or you, or you feel kind of numbed out, like you're sort of, um, you know, the clinical term would be like slightly dissociating, you know, sort of like just blurring out the world a little <laughs> bit, numbing out somehow to cope. Then, then those are things that are moving more towards like a post-traumatic stress response that would need like a specific kind of care or treatment. Um, and then maybe another issue would be more more likely, I'm going to guess, um, particularly for folks who are early in their careers, having a lot of anxiety. And when you feel like you're worrying like all the time about a lot of things and you can't control or stop those worries like at all, it's just a runaway train up there, all, <laughs> you know, that there's like no end to it. And it starts mm -hmm. the moment you wake up and doesn't stop like that type of intrusive worry probably would benefit from some therapy. Um, similarly, if you're so like hyper vigilant or hyper aroused in your, in your body that you're starting to have panic symptoms a lot, sweaty palms, you know, I don't need to tell you all, I'm sure you can list yeah. the things, but just as a reminder, can't catch your breath, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know, those sorts of phenomena, um, then, you know, you might be developing some kind of a panic disorder or something like that as well. Again, not like an occasional one-off thing, but if it's like a happening quite often, then, then panic would be another thing that a therapist could help you, you know, develop a lot of the stuff I talk about yeah. in a general sense in the book, but do a much deeper dive mm -hmm. uh, around those issues. And then, you know, for some folks also, depression is something to pay attention to if you start to feel like you know just nothing gives you pleasure anymore feeling down depressed you know that kind of stuff um then depression might be showing up as well there's a lot of things you know also yeah. again I, I encourage people to look at their history look at their family history think about their past life experiences if you've had traumas in your past if you come into your career with an anxiety issue or depression already yeah, that's something extra to sort of have to manage and work with, you know, so being extra proactive in those cases is important. Yeah. And I don't think that nursing of all, well, uh, like medical professions where you learn all these disease processes, it does not help those of us who like already have like a baseline struggle with anxiety because you're like, what do I, it's like difficult to self like appraise these, yes. like not, it's not like my blood pressure is this, or mm -hmm. this is here or not. I'm have to notice things about myself. And a lot of us spend a lot of time trying not to know 
notice. Right, it. right, right. It's yes. like, oh, I'm like, it's so in yeah. my own head. So um, I yeah. think having those like laid out is really helpful because nurses also, I think, tend to wait too long. Mm -hmm. um, and, and like to compare, like, instead of like an early intervention for our patient, it'd be like, let's wait till we code to see what happens. <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, oh, we don't need to do that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I mean, this is why I think that proactive approach is important. And, you know, one of the processes I guide people through in the book is to really do and identify your what I call your helper blueprint, which is like, how did you learn to be a helper? in your life, you know, what, what are those early life experiences where you felt that reward or that longing to help? And what does that do for you emotionally? You know, I mean, it feels good, sure, but a lot of things feel good, but you chose this as a profession, yeah. <laughs> you know? So like, are we holding ourselves to some standard, you know, based on some of our past experiences, or we have some assumption that everyone we try to help is supposed to be grateful for the help we offer? Ooh, <laughs> or like yes. every time we help someone, they're supposed to get better and, you know, things can't go wrong even when we try our best or like what are the rules that we've internalized about our helping and how are those maybe going to create some vulnerabilities down the line oh man what a so y'all need to get this book <laughs> where can we find it what's the best place to find you learn more about you and uh, dig into this Sure. Yeah. The book is uh, on Amazon. It's in paperback, hardcover. It's on Kindle and there's an audio book in production. So that'll also be on Audible because I know that will make it more accessible mm -hmm. to a lot of folks who are out there running around doing the work to save the world. <laughs> yes. Wonderful. <laughs> yeah. So all the formats are are mostly out, just the audio book that's on the way still. And you can go to thewellhelper.com uh, to learn more, hear more about me. There will be some live events, upcoming courses, things like that. So get on the email list and I'll keep you in the loop on what's to come. And um, yeah, everything's on Amazon though, in terms of shopping. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, thank you so much, Dr. King, for your time. Pleasure. Thanks so much. I appreciate the conversation. So I hope you guys enjoyed the interview. I learned a lot. Like I, like I mentioned, I have a lot of that book, uh, some notes and everything that were just, I felt really helpful and insightful. It's great to get these perspectives that are not just like um, self carry. It feels very actionable. So hope it's refreshing. I hope you took away some really helpful points to move the needle. Um, one big update with me. My family and I, we're moving. We're moving out of state. So uh, I got two kids. It's a lot of work. <laughs> so I will not be doing new podcast episodes for a little while. I got to get settled in my new spot, y'all. It's going to be a little hectic. So we're, gonna, we're not going to be doing new episodes until the fall. Now, here's the deal, though. I am, however, going to re-release some of our most popular episodes as sort of an encore situation. So you're going to see some of those coming out, um, some of those classic episodes that while they were recorded a while ago, man, they are quite evergreen. So I hope you enjoy those. Um, and to stay updated on all the Fresh RN things, go to freshrn.com. You can sign up for our email list. I'll put a link to do that in the description. Make sure you do all the like, subscribe, rate, review stuff. That is just so helpful. If any of this content has helped you at all, those are just free little ways that you can help us out and keep the podcast going, the blog going. As you know, all of this is a ton of work and I just appreciate your support. So thanks for listening and stay fresh.